I was glad that we clarified during our prayer time that it is David Anderson that is looking for uh, an interview. David Atmore is not in any way, shape, or form. But certainly, Dave, we will be praying for you concerning that. A couple weeks ago, Janelle and I had the opportunity, or maybe I should say the misfortune, of watching the Oscars. Uh, I typically do not like those kinds of award shows. I find them very self-congratulatory. Uh, the speeches that are given are mundane and repetitive. Virtually everyone says the same thing over and over and over again. But there's, there's just, you know, be, for us, we were away. We were in a hotel in, you know, not in our, uh, our own native town here. Uh, and so the channels were limited, and so we were forced to watch this <laughs> debacle. Um, as, as you've probably heard, the, the Cinderella story of this year's Oscars was the film entitled Everywhere, or Everything Everywhere All at Once. Um, I don't know how it won, but it did. Uh, this, this particular film would take home... Uh, seven, seven Academy Awards. Um, they would win for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, Best Supporting Actress. I mean, it just, it, it took all the major categories uh, of the film. Uh, one thing, though, I, I have found just uh, very interesting, it, it's been that in the days that followed, uh, various critics and commentators have have sought to point out how, how much of a rift there is between Hollywood and the general populace. Because the, the films that always seem to win at the Oscars are, are not the fan favorites. Uh, and, and you can tell that by just looking at the, the totals that, that are put forward from the box office. Uh, so for example, uh, this movie, Everything, everywhere, all at once, grossed about $160 million worldwide. Uh, it is not in the top 10 uh, of the bestsellers of 2022. It's not in the top 20 bestsellers in 2022. It is not in the top 30 uh, of the best movies or best grossing movies uh, of 2022. The best grossing movie of 2022 is James Cameron's Avatar, The Way of Water. It grossed about $2.3 billion. Then there was Top Gun Maverick, $1.5 billion. Uh, then after that, um, what was it? Jurassic World, a movie about dinosaurs, like the fifth, sixth, seventh installment uh, that made $1 billion. We are not a complex people. We as the hoi polloi, the, the common man, we, we are not excited about the complex or the cluttered. We, we want a simple, straightforward story. We want to learn about a hero who steps to the plate. A man or a group of individuals who will put their own lives in jeopardy uh, to save those who can't make it on their own. Those who will lay down their lives for the sake of others. It's perhaps because we enjoy these kind of stories that scripture itself is so compelling. Because Jesus Christ is the greatest hero of all time. He's the supreme protector, the one who delivers his people from the penalty of sin and, and sustains them until they reach their heavenly home. So with that in mind, let's open our Bibles and turn once again to the Gospel of John. This morning, let's turn to John chapter 10. Today, we're going to focus on the third uh, I am statement. John recur re records seven of them in his gospel account, but today we're going to look at the third. It's here that Jesus in John chapter 10, verse 7, makes that surprising announcement. He says, I am the door of the sheep. 
And in making this pronouncement, Jesus is presenting himself as both the portal to and the protector of the sheep. He's the portal to and the protector of the sheep. He not only saves, saves them, saves all who come to him by faith, but ensures that they will enjoy that eternal life, the life that he offers to those who follow him. So with that in mind, let's stand for the reading of God's word. Uh, we'll read John chapter 10, beginning at verse 1, and continue reading to the end of verse 10. And here we find that Jesus is the portal to and the protector of the sheep and the eternal life that they enjoy. So John chapter 10, verse 1. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who does not enter by the door into the fold of the sheep but climbs up by some other way, he is a thief and a robber. But he who enters by the door is a shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens and the sheep hear his voice and he calls them his own sheep by name and he leads them out. When he puts forth all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. A stranger they simply will not follow, but will flee from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. This, this figure of speech, Jesus spoke to them, but they did not understand what those things were which he had been saying to them. So Jesus said to them again, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me were thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill and to, or, or to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. Let's ask the Lord to bless the reading of his word. Let's pray together. Father, we recognize that every good and every perfect gift comes down from you, the Father of lights in whom there is no shifting shadow. And so this morning we have come to, to read the treasure of all treasures. We have get, come to gaze upon that priceless jewel your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to understand who he is and what he has accomplished on our behalf. And so we pray this morning that your spirit would be at work amongst us, that he would clarify our muddled thoughts, that he would enliven our, our, our feeble hearts, that he would excite us by the glory of and the majesty of the King of kings and Lord of lords. Help us to understand the text before us so that we might find true confidence, true assurance in the person and work of your Son, and in this that we might give you all the glory that you deserve. And so we pray this in the precious name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Please be seated. Before we get into this morning's study, I feel there's uh, something I should clarify. Uh, those of you who are undoubtedly familiar with John's gospel, and particularly John chapter 10, uh, understand that this chapter contains not one, but two of the I am statements. That Jesus' statement in John chapter 10, verse 7, I am the door of the sheep, is closely followed uh, by his statement in John chapter 10, verse 11, I am the good shepherd. What happens in John chapter 10, verses 1 through 10, uh, it really flows seamlessly uh, into John chapter 11, verses 11, or John chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. Um, so that, with that in mind, we're not really going to uh, follow the text as we usually do. We're not going to examine it verse by verse. Um, there are certain things that we're going to skip over. I'm going to be doing a little bit of cherry picking this morning. Uh, but I say that because if there's something that we miss today, that's intentional because that whatever we miss today is going to be picked up next week. Um, 
But today, really, we're focusing on the picture that is presented uh, to us this morning, the, the figure that Jesus uses to describe himself. So we're going to begin by looking at the picture. Uh, then I want us to look at the events that have led Jesus to employ this particular figure of speech, and then we're going to consider the purpose, why he does that. So we're going to look at the picture, the preceding events, and the purpose for which Jesus makes this statement. Uh, And as we look at each aspect, we'll find that Jesus is the portal to, he is the protector of the sheep and the eternal life that they are to enjoy. So let's begin then by looking uh, at the picture itself. Uh, Jesus presents himself as the door of the sheep, and in, in presenting himself in that way, he is describing something that is, that is quite familiar uh, to his audience. Being an agrarian society, uh, the Jewish people were used to watching shepherds as they would lead their small flock of sheep across the landscape. Uh, after spending the day grazing in green pastures, after leading them beside still waters, we know that the shepherd would bring his flock into the sheepfold. We know that this because given the abundance of wild predators, the complete absence of any sort of modern fencing, these, these shepherds could not afford just to leave their sheep out in the fields alone. I mean, they're defenseless creatures. They are incredibly dumb. The fact that Scripture refers to us as sheep is not a compliment. I mean, our our family used to raise sheep in in Ontario, and I tell you, they are the dumbest of all creatures. They are entirely helpless. Um, I mean, even if they lay down and they fall on their back, uh, they are in mortal danger. I remember coming out one day, uh, I had to, you know, get on a bus to go to school. We, we lived kind of 20 kilometers outside of town, uh, and we had 13, 20 sheep, something like that, and, and as I came out and got ready to go down the hill to, to catch my bus, there was Lammy on the hillside, his feet straight up in the air, and I went to go and help him and to turn him over, and, but he was stiff. He wouldn't move. He wouldn't respond. He had fallen over at some time in the night and and had simply could not get up. His heart could not handle it. He was as stiff as a board. He was dead. I mean, that's how dumb these creatures are, how defenseless, how helpless they are. And, and, And Palestine was not a safe place. Palestine is full of all kinds of predatory animals. There's lions and bears, there's jackals and hyenas and panthers. And all of them look upon the shepherd's sheep as as an easy meal. And that doesn't even take into account human predators. So for this reason, each night, the sheep were headed into some kind of sheep hold. And and generally, there were two different kinds uh, of sheep folds. If the shepherd was forced to, uh, to pasture his flock deep in the countryside, uh, the, the fold was rather cl- crude. It could be rather small. Um, it could be constructed of either wood or stone. But it was a, a low-walled corral, an enclosure with a narrow opening at the front. And as the shepherd brought each sheep to the mouth of the pen, He'd stop there and carefully inspect that animal just to to see if there were any ticks or scrapes or things that needed to be treated. And only then would he allow the sheep uh, to go deeper into the fold. Then once the entire flock was safely tucked away, the shepherd would actually lie down in the opening. Again, it it was so small that only one sheep at a time could enter the fold. There was room for no one else. And so as the shepherd lay down at the entrance of this enclosure, he himself would become the door. No one could go in or out without actually disturbing him, alerting him to their presence. If, however, the the shepherd was caring for the sheep a little closer to home, 
He would make use of the town's communal sheepfold. sheepfold. This, this was a larger enclosure. It, it, was, it, it was of a better construction. Uh, it was able to contain more than one flock at a time. And this will kind of come into play as we look at this text uh, next week. Uh, but these walls were not really protected. Uh, they didn't have barbed wire in those days, so they made do. Sometimes they would place large thorns or rows of thorns uh, on the top of these pens just to keep others from, from trying to climb inside. Uh, But unlike these, you know, they're smaller, the smaller folds in the, in the countryside, the chief security feature of these enclosures, these larger enclosures, was the gate or the professional gatekeeper. See, there was one individual employed by the town, by the shepherds of the town, to guard their flocks. While they would bring in each flock by night, this person would stay while these individuals went home to get a quiet night's sleep, to rejuvenate for the next morning. And so this individual's task was simple. He would admit no one into the sheepfold whom he did not know personally, whom he did not recognize as a shepherd of the sheep. He didn't open the gate to anyone but those who employed him. Not only were strangers barred from the enclosure, but they were chased away. And here in John chapter 10, verse 7, Jesus describes himself both as the door and the doorkeeper. The sheep are the individuals who have put their faith and their trust in him. The sheepfold is either, broadly speaking, the kingdom of heaven... Uh, or it is the redeemed company of Israel, uh, the thieves and robbers, these are the religious leaders of the day. Which brings us really to the question of why. Why did Jesus present this teaching? Why does he describe himself as the door to the sheep? Well, in answering these questions, it's helpful to, for us to consider the context which gave rise to this instruction. We know here that John 10 flows naturally out of John chapter 9. It's there that Jesus heals a man who has been blind from birth. It's not that he has lost his sight. Uh, it's not that he's been impacted some, by some sort of disease uh, which has caused his vision to fail. No, this man has not seen a thing one day in his life, he has been blind from birth. But somehow Jesus comes along. He spits in his hand. He gathers some soil from the earth. He, he, he moistens that soil. He, he makes a little bit of clay. He applies it to the man's eyes. And then he commands the man to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. And as the man does that, as he is obedient to the command of the Lord Jesus Christ, he now finds he can see. That a miracle has been performed. He sees perfectly. It's not blurry. Uh, he doesn't have cataracts here or there. Uh, he doesn't need to go and see the op ophthalmologist just to... to to get a grasp of what's actually going on, to distinguish colors, to, to know what things look like. No, this guy, he sees and he perceives things perfectly. It is a total transformation. It is a complete miracle. But because this miracle has taken place on the Sabbath, the religious leaders, the Pharisees in particular, they are absolutely incensed. After debating this individual about the identity of his healer, a man he has still not seen, after interrogating his parents, 
these leaders do the unthinkable. When the formerly blind man identifies Jesus, again, a man who he has never seen as nothing less than a prophet from God, it's then that they decide to excommunicate him, uh, to expel him from the local synagogue. That, I mean, we cannot understand the significance of that event. For the average Jew, the synagogue was the epicenter of, of all Jewish life. That was a communal gathering place. That was a place where uh, people could come to, to study God's word. Uh, this was a place where relationships were formed. Uh, this was probably where you know, young men would meet their future spouse. Uh, this was where business could be conducted. But this man has been pushed outside. He's been expelled. And the religious leaders do that because they say that this man has been born entirely in his sin. They, see, they take umbrage at the fact that he, he now, this blind man, who has now regained his sight by someone who has done something that has never been done in the nation of Israel, could possibly speak to them about spiritual realities. It's then that Jesus returns to the scene of the crime. It's then that he introduces himself to this man as the son of God. This blind individual or formerly blind individual, he doesn't question that. He simply says, Lord, I believe. And it's because of that confession of faith that the Pharisees now take umbrage with the Lord Jesus and his ministry. It's because of these events that Jesus says these words. And he says these words because he has two purposes in mind. First, what Jesus wants to do by saying, I am the door of the sheep, is he wants to present a contrast between himself and the religious rulers of the day. Look at what he says in verses 7 and 8. So Jesus said to them again, truly, truly, whenever Jesus says that, verily, verily, amen or amen, he is saying something significant. He is saying something that we need to take note of. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. You need to understand that, understand that Jesus is not pointing his finger at the prophets of old. He is not condemning individuals like Moses or Elijah or Isaiah. He's not speaking about John the Baptist. Jesus is saying these things while he is staring the religious leaders of the day in the face. He is pointing directly at the Pharisees. He says these things. He calls them thieves and robbers because they had no legitimate place within the kingdom of God. These people have not been properly commissioned by God to tend his flock. They are interlopers. These are men who have assumed this position of their own accord in order to satisfy their own needs and desires. They care nothing for the sheep. They want to exploit them. How do we know this? We just have to go back to John chapter 9 and, and look how they re reacted to the, the man who has received his sight. I mean, this man has been blind from birth. And then when he is, he is brought forth, uh, when this miracle is proclaimed, what do they do? They do not rejoice. They do not stand in awe or wonder. There is no sense of relief for this individual. A miracle has happened. 
But instead of congratulating the individual, instead of celebrating this miraculous change of affairs, they assault him with charges and in innuendo. Their only concern is to find the culprit who has challenged their authority by performing some unlicensed, dastardly deed. And yet Jesus is entirely different in his approach to this man. He ministers to the man in his time of need. He gives him sight after a lifetime of darkness. He, he then leaves because he is not interested merely in, in, in hearing the praises of the people. He's not in it just for the accolades of the masses. But he comes back. Uh, he returns, not when this man is isolated and alone. He doesn't come back once the crowds have dissipated, once the danger is over. He comes back while this man is still surrounded by these angry officials. Men who are still breathing out their condemnation. And he comes forward because he truly cares for the sheep. Which really brings us then to the Lord's second purpose. Not only does he do this, not only does he say these words because he is creating a contrast between himself and the religious leaders of the day, but he's doing this because, and makes this statement, because he wants to bolster the confidence of his followers. That he will not treat them as their earthly rulers will treat them. It is because of his great care and concern that Jesus presents himself as the door of the sheep. It is through him and him alone that the people will find peace and rest for their weary souls. All who come to him by faith will be saved from the wrath to come. Look again at verses 9 and 10. Jesus says, I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. I want you to notice the strength of the metaphor here. Because not only is Jesus presenting himself as the portal to salvation which is significant in and of itself. God's wrath is coming for every single human being, man, woman, or child. We are, by nature, children of wrath. We all have fallen short of the glory of God. We all deserve His righteous indignation. And yet Christ saves those who come to faith in him. But that's not the only emphasis here. It's, it's, it's not just that Jesus is the portal uh, to salvation, the door that you must pass through. He is the one who protects his people until they reach that final destination, that glorious home. Not only will those who come to Jesus believing that he, is the, that, God, that he is God's eternal son be saved, but the text says that they will go in and out and find pasture. They will do so safely. They will be secure. No matter the foe or the circumstance which, in which they find themselves. And Jesus is going to reaffirm this later on in this same chapter. Verse 27. Look at verse 27, just probably over the page. Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they will follow me, and I will give eternal life to them, and they will never perish, and no one will ever snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Believers are doubly protected. They are kept by the Son, by Christ, the one who purchased their redemption. Uh, they are defended by the Father, the, the one who gives the elect sinner as, as his love gift to his Son. 
But there's more because believers are shrouded by a third layer of protection because in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, we're told that we have been sealed by the Spirit of God for the day of redemption. It's done. That there is no chance of the believer falling from grace. We are secure not because of who we are, not because of what we have done or will do. We are saved because Christ's work is perfect and needs no improvement. It is absolute and unfailing. Do you understand then the implications of this teaching? The psalmist did. We don't know who wrote uh, Psalm 118. It may have been Moses. Uh, it could have been King David himself or some other Old Testament writer. But whoever that individual was, they rightly grasped the significance of the Lord's protective power. Listen to what this individual said beginning at verse 5. He said, From my distress I called upon the Lord, and the Lord answered me and set me in a large place. The Lord is for me. I will not fear. For what can man do to me? He goes on. The Lord is for me among those who help me. Therefore, I will look with satisfaction on those who hate me. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in princes. All nations will surround me. And yet in the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me. Yes, they surrounded me. But in the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. They surrounded me like bees and yet they were extinguished as a fire of thorns. In the name of the Lord, I will surely cut them off. You pushed me violently so that I was falling, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. The sound of joyful shouting and salvation is in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. I will not die but live to tell the works of the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we live in a world that is fraught with danger. We live amongst the people who despise all that we stand for. They call us Bible thumpers and bigots. They threaten to censor us or to imprison us for saying that homosexuality is a sin, by saying that transgenderism is false, that there is nothing more than a man who is a man or a woman who is a woman. That you can't pretend to be anything else besides. They may threaten our jobs, our freedom, our physical well-being. But here's the reality of the situation. The reality of living in a sick sin world. We are the safest people on planet Earth. Because of the God we serve. We will have struggles. There will be pain and heartache. Jesus has never promised to remove us from such things, but to protect us in the midst of them. No one can steal our hope. No one can take his promise. Uh, no one can rob us of the abundant life that we have in him. Why? Because he will never leave us or forsake us. He is with us now, always, even to the end of the age. So the question really is, do you know that sense of security? If you are a believer, I urge you to find peace by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I urge you to come to him now. 
to come to him acknowledging your sin, your need of forgiveness, to come to him knowing that he died on Calvary's cross for you, to pay the penalty you deserve, come to him knowing that, his, that he promises to receive all who believe in him, pass through the door, recognizing that he will certainly not cast you out, do so today if you are a believer if you are concerned about the current state of affairs if you are concerned about how you ought to conduct yourself in this present evil age then I want you to remember the gatekeeper that there is no power of hell or scheme of man that can ever pluck you from his hand. I want you to remember that as long as Christ is the eternal Son of God, the one who was and is and evermore shall be, I want you to remember that as long as he is omnipotent, upholding all things by the power of just his word, I want you to remember that as long as he is absolutely sovereign, the one who ordains the the beginning from the end and the end from the beginning, who orchestrates all things according to the counsel of his will, as long as he is there, you are held in the grip of Almighty God. The wolves may circle the pen. The hyenas may cackle in the darkness. The thieves and robbers may come. But none of these feeble beings are able to separate you from the Son's plan and purpose for you. He is that ever-present, all-knowing, all-powerful protector. He is the one who will guard you, who will guide you, who will strengthen you, who will equip you to do his good work as we remain faithful to him and fix our eyes on him. He is our protector. Not only our portal to you, but the protector of the sheep and the eternal life that they enjoy. So let's remember to fix our eyes on Christ. Let's bow. Father, we thank you for this reminder this morning. It seems so, in a sense, so elementary. This seems to be Sunday School 101. And yet this truth is so profound. It impacts every aspect of our life. Uh, it's a truth that gives us boldness to present the gospel in the workplace, a place which says religion has no place here. Your God has no power here, no sway here. It gives us the ability to, to live as you have called us to live in a society that says don't do that or we'll lock you up. It gives us the, the boldness to step forward and to present the excellencies of the one who has saved us by his grace. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us to remember this simple lesson as we go from this place, that it would be rooted deep in our hearts and minds, that we would never forget this, that greater is he who is in us than he that is in the world. Father, help us to walk in that freedom, to walk in that boldness, and to give you the glory that you deserve. We pray all of these things because of your son, because of all that he's accomplished on our behalf. May we reflect that, that in the way in which we live. We pray this for your honor and glory. In Jesus' name, amen.